Good morning and welcome to Photo Joseph's Photo Moment. As many of you probably know, I'm homesick right now, feeling like absolute trash. But the new Lumix GH5 just had its big unveiling at CES, and so I couldn't not post something about this because there's a new video that was released, and I wanted to kind of go through that video uh, piece by piece and just analyze what is talked about and what we actually see on there and share what we now know about this incredible new camera that's coming. Now, just as a precursor, many of you also already know I am a Lumix Luminary. I'm sponsored by Panasonic as a Luminary, and so I certainly do have skin in this game, but even if I didn't, um, this is nothing short of an amazing camera. So, let's take a look at the video. All right, first let's just say that the spinning dial on its own is not some automated dial, that's just a computer animation. It's not going to automatically change. All right, so there's the top-down view of the uh, the main mode dial. So you use your standard PASM, your program, aperture priority, shutter priority, manual, and then manual video, which is where you're mostly shooting video. C1, 2, and 3, I don't think that any of that has changed from the GH4. Those are custom settings. You can create your own custom mode and uh, or custom presets and then dial them in and save them to a C1, C2, C3. And then under C3, there's three additional, two additional, so you have C, C3-1, C3-2, C3-3. So you basically you have five complete custom settings. And these are really important for well, any photographer really, but um, especially for filmmakers because there's a lot of things in the camera that you may want to change, multiple settings you'll want to change between environments, between um, locations, just between the type of shot that you want, say for example going to slow motion or um, you know, changing lighting environment, you want to go from a slow shutter speed to a high shutter speed, whatever, any number of things that require multiple settings to be changed in the camera to dial them all in. So this way you can change all those settings, save them as one of the custom settings, and then move on from there. Okay, so that's the first time we're looking at the full body of the GH5. And you know what, it looks a little bit more like the G7, I think, than the GH4, which is kind of interesting. A um, slightly different body shape to it. I don't have, since I'm home, <laughs> I don't have any of the other cameras with me to compare them to, but uh, unless I'm just hallucinating, I think this looks a little bit more like the G7. I'll we'll have to compare. All right, there's one of the really big pieces of information here. The 20.3 megapixel sensor without the low-pass filter. So if we go back a little bit, the GX85, which is a small consumer, eh, consumer, prosumer camera. Um, that's the one that I actually took to New Orleans, did the whole New Orleans video on. That was the first Lumix camera to not have the low pass filter. It was the, the same 16 megapixel sensor that was in the other cameras, but it didn't have the low pass, which made it sharper. The overall image was sharper. Now, one of the, the drawbacks apparently to not having a low pass filter is you can get more A more often. So if you're wearing a shirt with very fine checked pattern, um, I saw it in one case of louvered windows, just kind of louvered windows at a distance, they're very fine lines and they can tend to vibrate a little bit is one of the disadvantages of not having a low pass filter. But it's so uncommon for it to be a problem that by removing it and adding, therefore adding the sharpness, I think it's to the advantage of the camera to, to not have one. Um, so the GX85 and the GX80 in Europe did not have the low pass filters, had the same 16 megapixel sensor. The GX8, which is a higher end, definitely targeted at the stills photographer camera, is was the first and only until this camera to have a 20 megapixel sensor. So it's the first micro four thirds camera with a 20 megapixel sensor. So now this is combining those two. We got 20 megapixels and a removal of the low pass filter, which is going to make for higher resolution and even sharper images. So this is this is really really exciting. So it turns out that behind that HDMI door that you see right there is a full-size HDMI port. No more that mini, itsy, bitsy, tiny, little, super easy to break port. There's a full-size HDMI port and a USB-C port. So for data transfers off of the camera, uh, I don't know what else you use it for. Something that high speed seems crazy on a camera because no one really copies their files off the camera over USB. You're obviously, you're gonna be using a card reader. So not quite sure why, the benefit of having something that incredibly fast in there, but hey, uh, you know, faster is always better, right? But the full size HDMI port, that's huge. All right, so here are the five axis, dual image stabilization, body and lens. It says there allows five stops lower shutter speed. That's a lot. That's, uh, I, I, you know, I don't do it. I've never tested. I don't know would you really get five stops more, but regardless, having 
image stabilization that's both in the body and in the lens is incredible. And this was one of the things we talked about with the GX85. So you've got the body, in-body stabilization means that the sensor itself is moving. In lens stabilization means that the lens elements are moving. And when you put the two of them together, you get an incredible amount of stabilization. It's, pr it's truly remarkable to look through one of these uh, cameras, look through a lens with um, a really long lens when you got dual IS enabled and you turn it on and just everything just locks into place. It's, it's really incredible. That was, by the way, a new lens there. Let's back that up. Um, oops, play that through again. Ah, I can't seem to pause it at the right time. Anyway, to 12 to 60, yeah, I think is what it said. Yeah, 12 to 60 Leica lens. This is a new zoom lens. There we go. A little bit farther there. 12 to 60 uh, millimeter lens. So that's a 24 to 120 equivalent. 0.7 times large. I don't know what that means. It's not larger. 0.7x, 0.76x large. Point, I guess that's from the full. I don't know what that means. Anyway, it's big. It's a big viewfinder. Um, 3680 thousand dot OLED viewer. It's basically what this is saying is really big, really bright through the viewfinder, live viewfinder, which is you know, that's what you want. Okay, unlimited video recording in 4K, 60 frames per second or 50 frames per second for PAL. So this is this is enormously huge. First of all, most of you who are really into these cameras are probably very, very aware that in the world of professional video DSLRs, you are almost always limited to a 30-minute recording time, actually a 29-minute, 29-second recording time. As I understand it, this could be wrong, correct me in the comments if I'm wrong, but as I understand it, this has to do with the tax. If, uh, if a camera shoots more than 30 minutes, it is considered a video camera and has a totally different tax applied to it. I guess in the United States. I really don't understand. Anyway, there's a different tax applied to it. <clears throat> Panasonic, I, I don't know if it's just because they've got the whole video division or for whatever the reason, but they do not have that limit. And so um, I don't know if it means they're paying the tax on it or whatever it is, but you do not, you are not limited to 30 minute recordings on Lumix cameras, unlike you are with basically every other DSLR that shoots video out there. You know, that's, that's obviously a really, really big deal to be able to shoot for more than 30 minutes at a time. Now, of course, if you're doing most kind of film work, actual action film, your shots are maybe only a minute or two long each, so this seems like it's kind of unnecessary. But if you're doing any type of long-form recording, you're shooting a play, you're shooting a really long time lapse where you want to shoot video and then accelerate and decelerate, whatever. There's so many reasons you might want to shoot more than 30 minutes of video, and to be able to do that on these cameras internally is, is phenomenal. And, of course, it's in 4K. Okay, I had to throw away what I recorded for this particular segment because uh, the information that's on the screen is misleading, if not actually incorrect. Uh, I just watched an interview with one of the Panasonic guys at B&H, and he explained this whole thing much more clearly. So I took some notes on this. So let, let's talk about what this is. All right, so first of all, it says 422 10-bit internal recording. That is absolutely true. It then says 420 8-bit and 4K at 60p. So that would make you believe that, okay, you don't... Maybe the 422 10-bit is only for HD, which wasn't what I had heard before, but that's what I was understanding from this. So no, that is not correct. This is just badly done in here. It's 422 10-bit 30p, internal recording. So let me repeat that. 4K, that's ultra HD, that's double the width, double the height of high-definition footage, at 422 in 10-bit recorded to the internal memory card. The only limitation there is it's only at 30p or up to 30p. And you think, okay, what's the problem with that? So what? Well, the line below, 420 8-bit and 4K 60p, it's the 60p that's the kicker. So currently, well, when the camera starts shipping, it will do 422 10-bit 4K 30p to the memory card. If you want to record 60p, you got to go external. You got to go to an external source. But that is going to change. There are firmware updates already slated for this that by the summer, sometime in the summer, a firmware update will release that will give you 422 10-bit 4K 400 megabit to the internal card. That's out of the, out of this world. That is absolutely crazy. So the supposed limitation that's noted here is just really badly done. It doesn't say 4K on that top line where it really needs to do because otherwise it's confusing. But yeah, you get the full thing straight out of it. The only thing you don't get from day one is 60p. Um, but wow, that's pretty awesome. So while I'm talking about this, because I, I, there's some other information that doesn't go anywhere else in here, 
Um, so currently the 4K 60, let's see, 4K 60, 60 frame per second, 4208 bit is at 150 megabit. That's what you'll get um, at 150, but it's gonna go up to 400. That's the crazy part. Um, VFR also, variable frame rate. 4K now has variable frame rate up to 60 frames per second. HD variable frame rate now goes up to 180 frames per second. So that's pretty awesome. And uh, I think that's it for there. Okay, cool, let's get back to the video. All right, this is a big deal. All right, let me let this play through. So new autofocus system with advanced DFD, that's depth depth for defocus, depth field, depth, depth for defocus, I think is what it means. Technology for moving subjects. So if you watch the little animation here. Clearly tracking that object through um, through the scene there. Focus tracking on the mirrorless cameras has always been one of its weakest points when compared with traditional DSLRs. Focus tracking on mirrorless has not been as good as we wanted it to be. This is supposed to change all of that. This is supposed to be an incredible, incredible motion tracking autofocus system. So we shall see. Um, you know, proof will be in the pudding, but I cannot wait to get my hands on one of these and see what it can really do. Okay, so let me just back that up a little bit again. So looking at the top dial there, if you, it's not, now I'm really quite convinced this is more like the G7. I wish I had my bodies in here to look at, but uh, you'll notice there, there's a 6K mode at the top. It's not 6K video, this is 6K photo. All right, select the perfect shot from 30 frames per second and save it as an 18 megapixel image. So for those of you that are familiar with 4K photo, the whole idea behind 4K photo is you're shooting in 4K, right, UHD resolution, so double high definition, shooting 30 frames per second, and then being able to extract a still frame from that. Now that's, that's any video. I mean, you can extract a still frame from any video. The difference between shooting in 4K photo and shooting regular 4K video and extracting a frame are twofold. But first, when you put it in 4K photo, the camera automatically defaulted to the same aspect ratio that you would be shoot for shooting still, so 4-3 aspect ratio, whereas of course if you're shooting video, you're shooting in a 16 by 9 aspect ratio. Second, it would default to a higher shutter speed, so that you would get that, that frozen motion that you want in still photography, whereas in video, you usually have a slower shutter speed, you have a little bit of blur in the frames, but that's okay because it just makes the whole video look a little bit smoother. Not what you want when you're extracting a still. So uh, 4K photo, crop just, uh, not crop, but the aspect ratio shifted to 4.3 and um, and you had the higher shutter speed. So now the same thing is happening in 6K. Now with 4K, it was an eight megapixel still. With 6K, it's 18 megapixel. So you can shoot 18 megapixel, 30 frame per second. That's insane. That is it's way sufficient for me. I mean, even eight megapixels was sufficient for a magazine cover. 18 megapixel means it's sufficient for magazine cover with room to crop. You can shoot 30 frames per second. Imagine shooting sports at 30 frames per second. That perfect moment, it's all, you're gonna get it every time. This is so cool. Okay, so now this is talking about 4K photo. We get the same thing that I just talked about, but now up to 60 frames per second. So if eight megapixels enough, now you can shoot it at 60 frames per second. Dual SD card slots. This is huge. This is a really, really big one. So uh, again, haven't played with the camera. Don't know what the options are in here. Presumably, the default option is carryover. You fill up one card, it automatically goes over to the other, which could be fantastic for shooting video. So if you wanna shoot basically unlimited length video, since you don't have that 30 minute limit, if you've got this thing plugged into a power source, you could just record video all day long and just swap out, pull out card one when it gets full and it's, it's already recording to card two, then when it, and replace card one, obviously. When card two gets full, it'll switch back to card one, pull that out and just swap them back and forth all day long. Excuse me, so that's pretty awesome. Um, what I don't know if it'll do or not is simultaneous recording. Say, as a backup, record maybe your RAWs to one JPEGs to the other, or copy two files to both cards. I don't know what it'll do there. Um, but there's a lot of different things you can do when you have dual card slots. So this is really cool, really exciting. 
So Bluetooth and Wi-Fi, nothing new there. We've had that. Now, the Bluetooth and Wi-Fi that's in the GH4 is pretty... Actually, maybe it didn't have Bluetooth. Oh, right, Bluetooth is new. I guess Bluetooth is new. Okay, so I'm not quite sure what we're doing with Bluetooth. Um, but the Wi-Fi, certainly that's been around for a long time. Uh, it's in the GH4 and it is in all the Lumix cameras. The, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the Wi-Fi... Uh, setup and connection that's in the GH4 is quite old by today's standards and is a little bit kludgy to set up, whereas the newest cameras like the GX85, the GX8, uh, really they, the whole Wi-Fi wi -Fi connection thing works a lot better, works a lot faster. So this obviously is going to have the newer, later technology. And I'm very curious about the Bluetooth. I have no idea what that is. This is very, very cool. Optional battery grip. So now you can have uh, additional batteries in there. Now, I, obviously, you saw what I just saw. I can't tell if that's room for two batteries. Let's see here. Let's see if we can get. So it might actually, it might actually give us three batteries. Because look, you can see there up in the top left, the battery door is closed. Now, some grips you take, um, you would take off the battery door and then pull out the battery. And then the grip has a big post that goes into the battery hole, and then you would put two batteries into the grip. From this illustration, that's clearly not doing that, because that is the battery door. Absolutely, that is the battery door, which is closed, so presumably you could have a battery in it, then attaching this grip possibly with two more batteries in it. So that could give us three batteries of uh, power. I don't know, but that would be fantastic. And take a look there in the lower left. Oh, this is great. You can see a shutter speed and a control uh, shutter speed, a shutter button and a control dial, telling us that we can do vertical shooting. It really, that's all. That's all we get to see there. We really barely see it, but it means you can do vertical shooting. So you know you don't have to do this to shoot vertical. You can just rotate the camera. That's really, really great. That's something I definitely have missed from uh, my days of shooting with the Canon 1D 1DX series. And then what else does this say on there? Uh, just open and lock button. Okay, so that's all we're going to see on that. This guy, this is the optional XLR microphone adapter. This is replacing the YAG. So the YAG was a huge grip, that huge uh, piece that went onto the bottom of the GH4 that gave you XLR inputs and it gave you SDI outputs and um, and a power source, a place to plug in power. Um, as I've gone over in other videos, I've figured out the hard way that the GH4 YAG does not output over the SDI the same settings as whatever you set the camera to. Um, it is always outputting 1080i60, so that, or I think it was one other setting, 1080 PS, uh, anyway, only two, primarily 1080i60, definitely not what you would expect if you had set the camera to 1080p24, that's what you wanted to output, it wasn't doing that. So that's not even an issue anymore, there is no SDI output, um, which is fine because if, obviously it has HDMI out, and that's what you're going to want to go into your, um, into your uh, uh, Ninja Assassin or whatever type of Ninja Shogun, uh, Atomos Shogun, whatever uh, type of device that you want to do. But if you want your XLR inputs, this is how you do it. A little hot shoe attachment and away you go. Panasonic. So there we go. That is the new GH5. So I don't know about you guys, but I am super, super excited about this. I cannot wait to get this thing in my hands. I have no idea when I'm going to. Uh, fingers crossed it'll be sooner rather than later, and I will be able to show it to you guys firsthand. But this is an incredible, incredible camera. Um, just from reading the specs on here, from what I'm seeing, I'm super excited about it. Hope you guys are too. If you have any questions, post them in the comments, uh, and I will do my best to get the answers for you. I'll see what, what info I can get that I can share. And of course, as always, if you haven't yet, please do subscribe to this YouTube channel. I've noticed that only about 10% of the views come from subscribers, which means a lot of you are watching it, but not subscribing. So please do subscribe. That would be awesome. That uh, Then you'll get notified of, of new uh, videos once they're posted. And when I go live, which I'm going to be doing more on YouTube coming up in 2017 here, I think. So we'll see what happens. All right, guys. Take care. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.